I'm here with Jennifer Higdon. Jennifer's extensive body of work includes commissions for a wide array of musicians and ensembles. She won the Pulitzer Prize in Music in 2010 for her violin concerto. She's won Grammy Awards for her percussion, viola, and harp concertos. Her opera, Cold Mountain, won the International Opera Award for Best World Premiere in 2016. Jennifer teaches composition at the Curtis Institute of Music and is quite busy. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Susan. Good to be here. Oh, it's great to talk to you, always. Now, we're talking today about your piece, Voices, which is part of an album called Contemporary Voices by the Pacifica Quartet, a 2021 Grammy nominee for Best Chamber Music and Small Ensemble Performance. Voices is a piece that you wrote in 1993. I know, a while ago, right? <laughs> right. So tell us a story of Voices. Yeah, it actually was commissioned by the Philadelphia Chamber Music Society. And I was a, still a student at the University of Pennsylvania. And so I remember going to my advisors, my doctoral advisors at Penn and saying, I have this commission for a string quartet. Can I use this as my piece? And they said, yes. So it was commissioned by the Chamber Music Society for a group that I think maybe broke up right after. And I have to admit, I can't remember the name of the group, but... It, I got a fantastic performance as the Chamber Music Society was doing concerts at the convention center. And that was that was literally in 90, 1993. So in 1997, this is how long it takes things to evolve. I was asked to go up to a special camp for three composers and three string quartets run by Joan Tower in Sundance, Utah. So it's basically their off season. So no one's up there. So we have chamber music concerts. And I was paired with the Pacifica Quartet. This was in 1997, so quite a while ago. And I was just coming out of school. They had just come out of school. So we were all just trying to get our careers going. And this was the piece I had submitted when Joan asked me to submit something. And they loved the piece. And I think over the years, they've adopted it. So it, and they had been wanting to record it. That was the other thing. So when they came to me recently and said they were gonna do this, I was super excited because it's rare for a composer to actually have a group that has played something repeatedly over years. Normally, you know, Beethoven gets that kind of treatment and pieces do mature in the performances. And Pacifica, they're fantastic. I mean, they've just been a delight to work with through the years. So it's quite the trajectory that covers a chunk of time. <laughs> yes, and well, you wrote it in, in 93 and met Pacifica Quartet in 97, but you ended up dedicating it to them, is that right? That's right. It's because the, when the first group actually broke up and I mean, they all went their separate ways, it sat there for the longest time. And once we went through this Institute at Sundance, the Pacifica Quartet would periodically pull it out and play it. And they were doing this consistently enough. I thought, wow, these guys are really they're, they They really liked the piece. And I was kind of moved by their performances. So I thought, you know what? I should dedicate it to them. The fact that they're an established quartet that could do any music that they want, they do really incredible stuff. But the fact that they're coming back to my piece, that's kind of what a composer envisions ideally anyway. So could you talk about the, the idea for the piece? What inspired it? Well, I think uh, I was kind of challenging myself as a an emerging composer to create something that would start frenzied and then get calmer as the piece went on and would become more expansive as the piece went on. That's kind of the opposite of what we do when we try to build a piece, usually from a smaller texture, quieter texture, stiller textures, the things that are way more dramatic to build to something. But I thought, could I tell a bunch of stories, connect them logically and have them start out very, very frenzied and then get calmer as the piece went on. So the most logical thing was to make three movements that, that were basically shaped like that and to connect them with no break in between. And so that was the challenge for me musically. It, was, it made it tougher, but it also made an interesting response of extreme tension through the entire first movement to starting to release in the second movement to the third movement feels like you can breathe, basically. <laughs> Right. Well, definitely the three movements, the blitz plunges us immediately into an environment which I guess you describe in the notes as relentless, frenzied energy. Did you have any visual image behind that? Yeah, I was thinking about the old black and white films of the Blitzkrieg with planes dropping bombs. Um, so, and I thought, can you create relentlessness in a string quartet with enough thematic variation and color variation to keep it interesting, despite the fact that the tension stays 
completely there for like five or six minutes. Wow. So the second movement, soft and lacing, you actually describe a visual image, like a, a walk through a house in the middle of the night, which I love that because how many of us relate to getting up in the middle of the night <laughs> and, <laughs> and shifting shadows? Yeah, I've always found fascination with the moon. And I think part of it comes from living on a farm when I was growing up for part of my childhood and and being amazed at how the moon created magical shadows, believe it or not. And I've had enough insomnia also to say, oh, it's, the color changes, the moon changes, the angles in the room change. But they're also, when you get up at that time of the night, in the middle of the night, it's, everything is so quiet. The world is so still and that, the, and it's the kind of thing that a composer who's always attuned to audio is going, wow, stillness, which now I think back on the beginning of this uh, quarantine and the pandemic, it, the whole <laughs> the whole earth got to be that quiet. But it is partly a fascination of what do the shadows look like? You can't always tell what they are, but there's a safety in being in your home. That's the soft and lacing. It's almost like arms hugging you and saying it'll be OK. There's kind of a stillness to it. I know you grew up in a household. Your dad was a painter? Correct, yes. And so visual images are often a part of your inspiration. That's true. Absolutely. A lot of times when I'm writing, I have a visual image in my head. And when I'm orchestrating orchestra pieces, I actually imagine the colors of the orchestra and the instruments to also be correlated in the same way that a painter might paint a canvas. So, But I don't have synesthesia. <laughs> Interestingly, that's uh, people ask me that all the time. So the last movement we were talking about before we, we started the recording, grace. The piece takes you on a journey, and when you get to grace, it, it really is a calming sensation. Good. I, that means I did my job right. <laughs> it's, I, I was thinking to myself, can you make a piece that actually feels like it's breathing at the end and that that's the slowest point in the whole piece but part of that also for me as a young composer was discovering working on my harmonic language trying to figure out what was going to be my sound and stumbling across double stops that the strings could all do that would give kind of these luscious chords but there are interesting challenges physically in the physics of bowing strings where you have certain limitations as to what will sing what will soar and what will sustain so part of that for me was also just learning about what the instruments can and cannot do and coming up with a chord progression that i felt like it was true for me it violated a lot of the counterpoint and harmony rules that i'd studied in school but perhaps because this was my dissertation piece i think the beginning of the piece actually is probably my frenzy to get the dissertation done to get through the degree by the end i'm like i made it so <laughs> I think part of what you're hearing is me taking a really deep breath. But I, one of the things I was thinking about with that movement is the fact that grace has so many different meanings, that word, whether it's the title of a song like Amazing Your Grace, or it's the grace you witness in someone's act of kindness or the grace within our soul. There's so many things that you can attribute to that title. That kind of appealed to me because I remember thinking that I wanted this last movement to be kind of like an expansive absorption for everyone, but something that everyone could kind of relate to. It's interesting as you describe your process, I guess because this was a piece that you wrote so early in your professional life, some of the things you're describing are technical challenges and, and learning about the instruments and all of that. And, but, but you also have this emotional arc in it mm. as well. Does that, do they always go side by side? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, I think they do to a certain extent. And I, I know when you're younger and you're in college, you're late teens, going through your 20s, all emotions have like a level of intensity. They have not been tempered down with our wisdom and our life experiences that have kind of knocked us around a little bit. Now we can kind of think through problems and issues. But when you're young, you're still learning what it's like to have those emotions. And for me, I was constantly thinking, am I going to be able to do this when I'm right? This is an early commission for me. Is this something I can manage? And the string quartet repertoire is huge. It's absolutely, it's very daunting for any composer to think about all the incredible quartets like Beethoven wrote and the quartets of Haydn. I mean, all of those guys. So you're carrying a heavy weight, the knowledge of a heavy weight of history 
on your shoulders and you're thinking, how am I going to make my own way in this world? But I was kind of thinking of that because I was coming out of grad school. I really was trying to find my way in the world. This was like a, a chance at a flashlight and I wasn't sure I was operating the flashlight correctly. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you revisit a piece like this 28 years later, does it take you back to, to the, your state of mind when you wrote it or does it mean something new to you? Both, actually. It does bring me back to the state of mind and the emotion. But the other thing for me now looking back is saying, oh, I, I hear the little germ seeds of my style about to pop out. It's like I planted these specific seeds, each one of these movements, and I thought, which one's going to grow? It really felt like that to me. And then it started evolving. But the thing is, having a chance to look back basically more than a quarter of a century later, and hear it done by a really good group that I've known, and they've known me in a long time, really gives me an amazing viewpoint of what it's like to think of the trajectory of all of my different pieces and how different pieces connect to the first movement, different pieces connect to the second and to the third. And there are offshoots. You can actually kind of draw lines. That's an incredible gift because normally we our early works, we don't really get to go back to and a lot of times we don't want to go back because <laughs> they don't all work but this particular piece maybe it was the faith in the philadelphia chamber music society commissioning me a student to write a work there was something about that being validated by a real organization that had all professionals there was something about that that really made me step up my game and that was kind of an important lesson and also i just was amazed at their faith <laughs> in me and relieved. I was relieved when it worked. <laughs> Can you point to any particular parts of it that that have meant something to you and you've carried forward like that? Yeah, actually, I have loads of works that have the harmonic language of grace. There are quite like my harp concerto has a lot of the open fists, which the cello has in, which is a violation of the counterpoint rules. I've got lots of parallel fists in there. Um, and I, so I feel like a lot of my music, especially during the pandemic, probably veers more towards grace. I've got a bunch of works that are written that were requested to be very virtuosic that are kind of spiky. I have this piece running the edge and a piece called rapid fire that are much more like the first movement. And in fact, now to think about it, rapid fire was written the year before this. So I was also testing the waters of music, not being quite tonal, but being energetic and being communicative. And that middle section is very much like a lot of my, probably my choir music and my vocal songs. I mean, I literally can point to various pieces specifically connected, which is unusual because in a way, this is like a sampler box piece. I know. <laughs> it's, this is it's, exciting. It's, it's like, this is what I can do. And this is what. Yeah. I'm and will it work? That's usually you're like, you're testing things in the beginning. You write things, you think, oh, I hope this will work. And then sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. But I was lucky in this case because the three worked. But they also, that told me all three were valid harmonic worlds to move into, rhythmic worlds. I do really weird color things in the first movement by simple things like having pizzicato and arca overlap, so using the bow, but also plucking the string. And that's not an unusual technique, but I did it in a weird sort of fader thing where everybody's doing one thing and then slowly they fade into the other technique. So I think a lot of those things, I also was like, well, this will be the only string quartet I ever get to write and probably the only professional commission I'll get. So I was kind of putting everything in it, hoping it would work. The idea of voices, you called it voices. Mm -hmm. This album by Pacifica Quartet is called Contemporary Voices. Could you talk a little bit about what what that means? Oh, that's a good question. I know that the quartet had been wanting to record voices for a long time. Like, I think we've been talking about it for 15 years, but I know they were doing different projects where they would feature a particular composer. Um, they got to know, I'm trying to remember how this worked. I think it was Shulam and Ron. They overlapped at one point in Chicago. I think Pacifica moved to Indiana to teach and coach in the string quartet program, but they had worked doing a lot of the playing for the new music concerts that Shula Mitran had at her university. And so I think these guys, because they also wanted to work with uh, Otis Murphy, the saxophonist in the Zwillicht, um, I think that to them, they may have looked at, now that you mentioned it, and looked at my piece and said, oh, this is Voices. And th 
I have to be honest, as three women, I don't think they really thought about that, but I pointed out to them when we were putting the booklet material together that ironically, it was three women who'd won Pulitzer Prizes. And, and the look of surprise on their faces was, <laughs> was priceless. For me, it was hugely shocking because when I was going through school, as an undergrad, I became aware of Ellen's Willich. She was the first woman to win a Pulitzer Prize. So I was very aware of, and I think one of the first albums I got was her symphony that, that won. And ironically, Shulman and I have crossed paths when I was a student at Curtis, she had pieces done with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I remember that so clearly. So to get the be on a disc with them, but have these four people that I adore, who are excellent musicians. For me, my piece is just voices because it's telling three stories, but I suspect it's the same thing for the quartet. They're telling three stories from three different women's perspectives. You're also taking on rotating host duties on living American composers. Yes. You have an ongoing feature. That's exciting. An it ongoing- is. I'm super excited to be able to share that with the area. And it's totally, totally cool. <laughs> What's it like for you to, to host that series? Uh, you're doing living women composers? Yes, I've actually, I think this may be my eighth year doing this. It started because I went to Bowling Green. So when they decided to start the series with uh, the station there, WGTE in Toledo, they, they decided to create a program because Bowling Green has a new music festival and they thought, all right, we're gonna start broadcasting this. But I think it expanded quickly, it was so popular. They're like, well, maybe we should get some other music on here. And they came to me and said, would you be interested in working really with Brad Cresswell and, and design some programs. We'll do some programs on your music and then we'll do others. And then what happened during the first two years, a couple more women won Pulitzers and they realized that maybe they should try a different angle also. So I, I cut a lot of segments. I pick a lot of music for them and we cut segments and some of them are features of things from the new music festival. Some of them are features on my music and some of them are just women composers that music I kind of collect as I go through the year. And it helps me also in discovering what people are doing in other countries, but it's nice to be able to kind of give voice to those people who are creating who normally don't get a chance to have a voice. So how do you feel about going forward? What do you think about the state of composition today? Well, I think it's evolving, but it's always evolving. I think I can tell that things are getting better because suddenly I have loads of orchestras scheduling concerts in 2022. We are getting so many orders and people are rescheduling all the things that were delayed. Um, So it feels like it's growing. I think new music is becoming more relevant because I think the the composers are really interested in communicating with their listeners and with the performers. And so as a consequence, and I've also discovered after talking to audiences, a lot of them want to hear something different. They don't want to hear the same thing over and over. So there's room, I think, to make all of this work. And we just have to figure out a way to do it. The material is there on all sides. We just have to get it all kind of put together. Well, congratulations on this new album, on the gig with uh, Living American Composers, continuing that. Um, And it's been great to talk with you, Jennifer. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, Susan. Thank you so much.